So if you are prepared for the offering now, here's the thing. We're just going to do that now and get that kind of out of the road so we don't have to think about it again. Well, let's pray. Father God, I do thank you, Lord, for the privilege of doing this session. Lord, I love this session. I love this. This is so fun. And Lord, I just give you praise for all that you're doing for us. May we get it. May we get this understanding. And Lord, we just thank you for it. In Jesus' precious and holy name, give me your grace, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, have you been learning something so far? Do you see the progression that we were doing? We started off with bringing people an understanding of what's happening, and then we confessed. We had a time where we got rid of the denial. That's where things start. As soon as you get rid of denial, things start popping. That's really, really cool. And then we did what? We started taking away the identities that we had with the, with the porn, with the fornication. When you take off that identity and you identify with Christ and you step into him, boy, there is nothing better. That is the height. Then, this morning, we started dealing with stuff like taking off the curse of generations. Okay? How to, how to deal with that. How to deal with blessing your own, taking it on further. And then how to deal with lust. How to get the, the coffee grounds out of your mind. How to be transformed by the renewing. I mean, is there enough scripture on this stuff or what? Okay? It's right there, and it's deep, and it's very, very succinct, okay? Very, very cool. What we're going on now is we're going to start dealing with, uh, then we started talking about how to deal with lust. Lust is a big deal. You don't have to ever lust again. You don't have to. If you do, well, it's really kind of simple. You go back to Jesus. People have asked me, what happens if I've taken it all off and did all this stuff, and then I fell and, found my, and, and, and I did it again? Oh, well, they take away your birthday. That's the first thing that happens. And uh, they add five years on it so that you can't even complain about that. So, no, what? It's sin, right? Well, what do you do with sin? Same thing. Just take it to the Lord. There's no reason to beat yourself up and be further in condemnation. You say, but I know better. Yeah, that is a problem because now you do know better. But to whom much is given? Much is required. And so you're going to have a different walk. And along with it, new levels, new devils. Isn't that the old expression? The warfare kind of increases. Kind of. Just a little. I just lied to all these guys. <laughs> it jumps up. But it becomes that Phineas army that we've been talking about. You're going to take stuff on, and it's going to be, it's going to be a little crazy. But if we can walk free from lust, walk free from the defilement, walk in all the beauty that God has for us, man, how cool, huh? Amen. Amen. So anyway, this session, we're going to deal with all sorts of lies, all sorts of fun things that are just that have to be dealt with. But the first thing I want you to know is the first look is on God. You can't help it. You're walking along, minding your own business. You come around a corner, and there's somebody who forgot to wear the majority of the clothing they should have had on that day. You're going to see it. It's going to be there. Well, that first look, the time when you first look on that, that's on God. God gives you the grace to handle that. It doesn't defile you. It doesn't mess you up. It's fine. It's not a problem. That first look is on God. It's the second look that's on you. If you're going to look again and go, check it, you just blew it. Okay? First look is on God. You see, you don't have the luxury of ever just letting it happen. From this day on, every single instance is important, and it's on you. You have got to walk straight. You say, well, that's a lot of pressure on me, Lee. You're welcome. I don't know what to tell you. This is the walk we have. It's a warfare. You say, well, when do I get a reprieve? When you're alone, well, I don't know. A lot of us have had a real problem when we were alone. I couldn't stand being alone. I couldn't stand be alone with me. So you're going to have to deal with being alone because you're not alone. Walk that relationship with Jesus. You follow me? Yeah. Not alone. First look is on God. The second look, well, that's on you. Amen. Now, 
I told you that I like to read. I do. I really like to read. I like a good book. I like different things. But when I was growing up, back a long time ago, the porn was not all pictures. It was not all video. It wasn't all that. A lot of it was in book form. It was in text. Now, I can tell you right now, there are certain books that are so phenomenal, so amazing. They've tried to make movies of them, and they can't. It just doesn't cut it. There has never been a good movie on Ben-Hur. Never. Even that one that had Charlton Heston in it, that was a good movie. It was a fun story, but it wasn't the story. The story of Ben-Hur was so much bigger, so much better, so much brighter, so much... It, the whole idea... The title is actually Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. His whole purpose behind writing it was to disprove Christianity. And he was right in the middle of researching all this thing. And he came face to face with God himself. And he just like, wow, blew his head. He was a Civil War general. And he was intelligent. And he was, and he was going to take this on. And God said no. He turned that whole thing around. And he read, wrote Ben-Hur to prove, to show what it was like to be around Christ. What a book. Double Dog Dirty Dare you to read it, okay? But I read a lot of my porn. Now, I have the advantage of reading it. I learned an awful lot of what porn preaches, how it puts it out there. So I've been able to scrutinize the gospel of pornography. What is it that porn tells us, okay? It's not just pictures. There's attitudes. There's certain things, certain lies they get into our heads. So the, the gospel of pornography. Here's, here's the first lie. It will always thrill me, and it will always be the same. No matter what. Well, no, no, no. Because there's a law that we're going to be talking about. We get this lie, and we kind of stuff it into our heads, and it just goes into our heads, and there we go. There it is. There's the first lie, and it's right there in our heads. Okay? The law of diminished returns. Here's the issue. See that line? That's normal. What happened? Where's my tech people? Oh, there it is. It was because I didn't click the thing. Tech people are going to start throwing things. <laughs> that line is normal. For those of you who think I don't know what normal is, <laughs> there it is. That's normal. People say, you don't know what normal is. I do, too. It's a setting on a dryer. Go look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's normal. Here's the issue. Anything that comes into your life that's a stimulant has a high. The problem is, everybody will tell you, and not just Christians. We're talking about across the board, psychologically. The thing to tell you is, with every high, there's an equal and opposite low. When you come off of things, it really gets low. The problem is, you do that every now and then, and you don't come up to normal. You don't come back up to normal. What happens? Your high is lower than the high you used to have. And then you have that equal and opposite low, and what happens? It brings you up lower. We keep doing this. It's the law of diminished returns. What happens when your high brings you to normal? Okay. You know what? The, the people, the, the critic, or the people that study psychology and different things will tell you that if you need a high to bring you to normal, that's called an addiction. Isn't that interesting? If you need the drugs to bring you to normal, you're, you're, you're stuck. You're jammed. That's bad. Well, what happens when that next high doesn't even bring you to normal? You are messed up. It's the law of diminished returns. Let me explain this just a little bit. Some of you have gone down the road of alcohol. You know what it was like that first time you had that beer and got a little buzz? That was cool. And pretty soon, it took a little bit more to get that buzz. It took a little bit more. It took a little bit more. It took a little bit heavier alcohol to bring in. You know what this is like. It, what used to give you a return is now a diminished return. So people get harder drugs and harder drugs and harder drugs. Deeper alcohol, deeper alcohol. It just gets kind of crazy. It's the same thing with sex. 
I can remember my first kiss. Now that first kiss was absolutely fireworks. It was exciting. It was crazy. It was just a simple kiss on the railroad around the lake at Lakeside Amusement Park. <laughs> yeah. And people say, was it a steam engine? I could just leave it alone. So, <laughs> kind of fascinating. I remember that kiss. Man, I was soaring. It was sexual contact between me and a girl. Woo! Guess how long it took before that kiss was not enough? Didn't matter. I wanted that next kiss. That next kiss was okay. Next, this was okay. Then I became international. What do you mean by that? Well, I have Russian hands and Roman fingers, you know? <laughs> international. You'll get there. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> I have to explain it to you, Joe. It's just, it's just sad, buddy, okay? But I, I, want, I had to cop a feel. Well, what a boob feel like? I didn't care about the lips anymore. Big deal. I was using the lips to get her close enough so I could grab something. And then pretty soon, that wasn't enough either. You know how this works. Even in porn, you saw something. Almost most of the men that we get today got started on Playboy. And Playboy wouldn't show you anything but boobs. Interesting. Well, got hooked right there. Is that porn? Yeah, it's porn. Then they started showing other stuff and getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and even Playboy got deeper. All these different pet house, all these things started getting people going, and it got deeper and deeper and deeper. The law of diminished returns. So it's not just like, well, just a little bit. It's, not gonna, it's still going to be a thrill. No, it's going to quit thrilling. There's going to be deeper stuff. When you keep going, it starts getting you want something else to give you the thrill. That's one of the laws that we got to understand, the law of diminished returns. Here's another one. You'll love this lie. Here you go. Sex is only physical. It's only physical. It's just, just physical. It doesn't really matter. But you know as well as I do that sex doesn't happen between your legs first. Where does it start? Between your ears. Therefore, what? It's not just physical. It's also soulish. It requires your mind, your will, and your emotions. You're not an animal. You're not just doing it out of instinct to preserve, but that's what you think. You go, sex is only physical. I'll put that thought in my mind. Eh? <laughs> How's that working out? Thought is there, but the actuality is not because sex is not just physical. Hmm. That's a good one. We'll make sure I get in the right order here. I've heard this one so many times. Well, sex between consenting adults is okay. We're just adults. We can do what we please. Why do we have a different standard for kids than we do for adults? That doesn't make any sense at all. Consenting adults means what? Both of you are defiled and you're agreeing to be defiled. Okay? So there's a thought we'll feed into your brain. How's that? We'll just keep feeding that in there and just... Oh, that's cool, huh? Just, yeah. <laughs> Here's a good one. <coughs> Oops, I used the wrong one. That was okay for consenting adults. I put that one. Sex in my mind is harmless. That was the last one. I got him out of order. Be nice to me. Sex in your mind is harmless. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's just in my mind. Is that true? We, we can do that. Oh, we'll put this one in there. You, we can get our thoughts out of order, don't you think? <laughs> oh, here's a fun one. Huh. I don't even have one up here. Uh, sex makes you a man. You know, they even have a genre about that in movies. It's called what? Anybody know? It's a coming of age movie. Coming of age. Meaning what? Now you're old enough to have sex. 
There was a CSI. They did add a, they had a, a murderer out at a brothel. And they were trying to interview all the prostitutes about it. And they're saying, what? And this one gal says, well, where were you when this all happened? Well, this guy brought his son to me, and I made him a man. So is having sex make you a man? I know some 12-year-old men, and I know some 40-year-old boys. Okay. No, sex doesn't make you a man. Um, if I had my buddy Randall here, he was the one that, that had this wild story that his father um, trained racehorses, and they went all over doing racehorses, and they had a gal that was with them. She was called a hot walker, and that's not a sex term. That just means that they went out and walked the horses before a race and got them warmed up. And so the gal that three people did that was called a hot walker. And they went out to a city, and Randall's dad had this other man's wife that was with him and they were they got a hotel room so it was Randall Randall's dad and this other gal and then um, uh, this hot walker chick 18 years old and Randall he was about 12 13 so his dad came into this town as they're getting ready to do this and it got about 1 o'clock 2 o'clock in the morning and he got two hotel rooms one was for his dad and his girl and his, this married woman that he was traveling with. And they're going to go have sex. And they got one more room. And that room was for Randall and this chick. And the message was straight and clear. It's time for you to have sex, son. Time for you to be a man. So the girl said, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do this. And he said, fine, not a problem. Go back to Omaha. And she says, I don't have enough money to go back to Omaha. Then you're stuck. So she went in, went to bed, was just kind of pretending like she was sleeping, and she knew that she was going to let Randall do whatever he wanted to do in the hotel room. Because it's time for you to become a man. Well, he played with her body for a little while, and he got all hard, and then he couldn't handle it anymore, and he just went around the corner where the bathroom was and masturbated. He couldn't handle it, couldn't do it. His dad never asked him if he had sex. He just knew that he did. And Randall had this idea in his mind that he had always disappointed his father because his dad expected him to have had sex. And so a little bit later that summer, he was with his girlfriend, and they found this room behind uh, in one of the restaurants they were in out in eastern Colorado. They just nothing else to do. And he had sex for the first time and asking him, so now, are you a man? And he says, I knew that in my dad's mind, I was a man, but in my mind, I was less. Does having sex make you a man? No. Now, I, at this point, I brag on my son a lot, and he always he just rolls his eyes at me, but it's all cool. <laughs> I pick him up and roll him back. You know. What? <laughs> <laughs> he determined that he was not going to kiss a girl until the day he got married. Not just not have sex, but not even kiss a girl until the day he got married. We had the funnest wedding ceremony. And we had all this stuff happening, and, and all the guys got to carry swords in the wedding. Come on. <laughs> this all runs in the family. It's all good. And uh, they came up, and we blessed them. We had all this sort of stuff. And then when it came time, he was being one of the leaders in the youth group in the junior high department of this church. And he had promoted, he had told them, I'm not going to kiss a girl until the day I got married. So the day they got married, and it came down to that part of the wedding where I said, you may now kiss your bride. Jared put this lip lock on Tiffany, and there they were. Two hours later, we're still waiting. <laughs> not quite, but it was a healthy good time. He's going to say, if I'm going to do this as my first kiss, it's going to be a humdinger. And he kissed her totally legally, totally cool. And we're all saying, you know, that expression, get a room, you know. But we told him, he says, 
you already have a room. If you stop, we'll get you to it, okay? <laughs> so good. So anyway, and then all during the reception, he kept kissing her. What's up with that? He had finally gotten, and, he had, and she loved it, and he loved it, and it was cool because it was pure. How many of you wish you had done that? Yeah. Having sex makes you a man. Oh, uh, I didn't bring it. My wing gibbet still back at the house. Dang it. Okay. Yeah, again. Um, I have a wing gibbet. Uh, not often many of them have wings, but this one has wings. And this dude is this big. It's this big. And the wings on it are, are good, four inches across. I have a wing gibbet. You don't look impressed. I don't even know what that is. You don't? No. If you don't know what a wing gibbet is, then how do you know if that's a big one or a small one? You just don't know, do you? Yeah, you just I just told you it's this big, but it's, you don't know if it's a, it is it a big one. It's that big. Hmm. Here's the issue. Here's the big issue that we all have, and that is size and comparisons. If you don't know what a wing gibbet is, then how do you know if it's a big one or a small one? Your frame of reference is that you don't know. The only problem is there's no such thing as a wing gibbet, whether with or without wings. It doesn't matter. Made that whole dude up. But here's the thing. If you don't have a frame of reference on the thing, you don't know if it's big or small. Let me talk about your thingy one more time. Is it a big thingy? I know, if you bring it out and I have the knife out, it's going to end up being a small thingy. <laughs> okay? Is it big or is it small? I don't care what your size is. I don't want you to care what my size is. It doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because I'm supposed to have sex with only one woman my entire life. The thought is size matters. No, it doesn't. See, if I have sex with only one woman my entire life, and she has sex with only me her entire life, by what does she have to compare? Nothing. Mine's as big as they come. <laughs> to her, it's huge. And I'm not about to tell her different. Because <laughs> to her, size doesn't matter. What does matter? Two people getting together, having intimacy. That's all that matters. I don't care the size of yours, but I'll tell you something else. What we do is we put value on certain things, and we think women with big boobs are cool, and women with small boobs, that's not enough. And so we have made it so that size matters to women so that they go out and get surgery and get implants just to be cool. Are you out of your mind? Some of those implants start leaking, and then there's major surgery problems. There's all sorts of junk. Why? For what purpose? Bible says, let her breast satisfy you continually. I don't care the size of anybody else's. I have my wife. She has them, and there's nobody's business how size they are. They big, they small. No, they're mine. You keep your mind off of them. I don't want you looking at her in any way, shape, or form. I'm armed. And I believe in sharp. Keep your mind where it's supposed to be. We make women need bigger boobs because they're going to be accepted that way. Stupid. Absolutely stupid. Does size matter? No. Because it's only what we are doing in the confines of the holiness that God has for us in that, in that matter. So it doesn't matter, does it? Just doesn't matter. Now, there's a couple more that aren't on your notes or on anything because it's things that, that Jared and I have come up with and we've been talking about. We found a book that has a compilation of all these different studies and it gives a synopsis of what these studies are and it is, it is mind-blowing. We are going to put it on the website so that people can just get it for free and just have it. And it gives you, sends you to where all these studies are and you can look at them. 
But one of the things, people think that sex is free. Is sex free? Now, I'm a weirdo in the fact that all my 20 years, well, I can't confine that too badly. <laughs> I'm just a weirdo. But I have found that in my 20 years of addiction, I never paid for porn at all, ever. That makes me a weirdo on that right. Because I've never paid for it. How many others have? But even the sex, I may not have paid money, but did I pay for it? Oh, I paid and paid and paid and paid and paid. How I wish I had never seen any of it. How I wish I had just grown up all things being nice and righteous and wonderful and meet my wife and get married and have righteous sex and have no defilement in that thing at all in any way, shape, or form. How I wish that would be true. But that is a lot like any myth you can think of. That's like having alligators in your sewers or, or uh, Sasquatch coming in your backyard. Okay, these are myths anymore. Can we stay away from that kind of defilement? Man, it's tricky. But it can be done. But man, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be really tricky. And here's another one that really ticks me off. And I've heard people say this. Oh, the women in porn, they like it. Oh, they like it. They're acting. They're moaning and groaning like they really dig it. You want to hear the real statistics? 80%, 80 80% of the women in porn industry have to be drugged to do what they do. You say they like it. They don't like it. We put that thought in our heads. Fills your head with a bunch of junk, doesn't it? So what's inside yours? <laughs> what's inside yours? There's another one I don't, that is not a lie, but it is part of the gospel pornography. And here's the problem that I am trying to alleviate. I'm trying to stop this one, and that's this. The world knows more about sex than church. Well, they kind of do. Why? Because they're not afraid to talk about it. Church people are. I talk about it. <laughs> all the time okay but because I deal with men on sexual issues all the people that I hang around with that do the one on one ministry stuff the counseling ministry things when they find somebody that has sex issues, issues they send them to me I'm known as the sex guy I have to go deal with sex for everything you know and that's okay by me I'm okay by that because I know that I can get somebody set free I have seen women who were prostitutes brought to the point where they were actually embarrassed by itty bitty stuff. And it's just like, oh, they just, they were brought back to innocence. God, are you kidding? God can do this. And God can take those of us who've been in this porn stuff for so long and bring us back to a point where it's bad news and we are able to walk in holiness and keep that stuff away. Why shouldn't we be like that, huh? I got to preaching there. Women want it and love it? No. Oh, let's talk about one of my favorite subjects in life. <laughs> you say, that's one of your favorite subjects? Well, it seems to be because I'm always talking about it. Masturbation. What in the world is it? Okay. Well, it's a guy getting all turned around and doing himself until he ejaculates. That's called masturbation. Okay, you can do it in all sorts of different ways. Most of us, sex would be just masturbation, using a woman as a masturbation bag. We have no relationship with her. We just use her to pump into. Isn't that ridiculous? I'm trying to de-glamorize all this stuff that we've glamorized all before. A guy came in to me and he says, I've been dealing with porn. And I said, uh, so are you masturbating? He looked at me like, you're an idiot. He says, without it, what's the point? <laughs> you're, well, you're right. Just looking at it isn't the issue, is it? Looking at it to get aroused is the issue. Doing something about it, that's the issue, Okay. But it needs the mind for fantasy for fuel. 
It needs the mind. It's not just physical. It is a soulish effort of everything you're doing. It's part of what's going on. It needs fantasy. It needs the mind for fuel. It does these kind of weird things. I heard this while I was going to the prison. Oh, God gave us masturbation so the prisoners could have sex. Safe sex. Well, what's unsafe sex in prison? Is it unsafe? Well, yeah, there's lots of diseases and stuff going on. Is it safe to have sex in prison? <laughs> I, I used to laugh at these guys go, what? <laughs> so I got to tell you this story. This is, this is wild. So I'm talking to one of these guys, and he says, well, masturbation, it, it's okay. I said, is it really? Now, I, I put on my sarcasm coat, okay? This is sarcasm. This is tongue in cheek. This is about as... <laughs> Come on, and you'll, as soon as you hear it, you're going to go, how did the guy miss not seeing that that was just sarcasm? Okay? I said, so, you think it's godly, huh? And he says, yeah. And I says, well, tell you what. Anything a Christian does will be enhanced by worship, right? So next time you're pumping away, I want you to throw your hands up in the air and start worshiping God, and it's going to enhance the whole masturbation experience, Okay? Was there enough sarcasm there? Do you think he should have seen that? And he says, oh, okay, and walked away. I kind of shook my head. <laughs> That's just weird. Okay, he walked away. Fine. So the next week, I come walk up to the fence. Now, I tell you, it's just a chain link fence. So they have this gate that's on rollers, and they roll back, and you walk in. <coughs> and... <coughs> I'm there, and I got my guitar in one hand, briefcase in the other, and I'm walking up to the gate, and he's standing just on the other side, and he's got his arms folded. Now, these guys work out all the time. You understand? That's what they do. They, between porn and working out, that's their day. And so I look around, and this guy's got arms the size of my thighs, right? And he's just a <laughs> bit massive guy, and he's standing there with his arms crossed, and he's glaring at me. And now he's mad. He is ticked going, this doesn't look good. This is not a good way to start the evening, you know. So I walk up the gate and I says, what's the matter with you? Nice, warm day, 100 guys all out in the, the walking area, the commons area. They're all there by the gate, all around. Everybody's standing around, a bunch of people. And this guy says, and he doesn't say it lightly. This is not a private conversation. He says this very loudly. He says, you ruined it. It's been seven days. You understand? There's no frame of reference here. I have no idea what he's talking about. You do. You got a little idea. But I'm sitting there going, ruined what? I didn't do anything. What have I ruined? And he says out loud with the same volume, masturbation. Now, a hundred heads all go, huh? You know? Everybody in the yard is now looking at him. And I'm still trying to catch up. So, you know, what's wrong with you? You ruined it. Ruined what? Masturbation. What? And I'm trying, and then it occurs to me in a little flood of memory, and I get tickled. Okay. This is not a good time to be laughing. <clears throat> he could pop my pimple, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay? And I looked at, I start, I got my hands full, so I can't hide it. I go, <clears throat> just and I'm trying to hold it together and he says I says what happened <laughs> and he says I did what you said oh god please do. everybody's listening there's a hundred guys listening to this conversation I says and what was that you know and he says I was pumping away and I said I gotta worship I worship and I went limp. You ruined it for me. <laughs> now that conversation actually happened. I just got to tell you about it. So Weird. So I, I want anybody, I need more empirical evidence on this. And so if anybody wants to give us a try. It's scientific. Okay. Lord, have mercy. One of the biggest questions I get asked is, well, can't I use a mental picture of my wife to masturbate with? Come on, 
fun. That's cool. Huh? Got my wife and thinking about her. Hey, it's all good sex, right? Yeah, right. Except that fantasy woman using your wife's face, that fantasy woman is not your wife because that fantasy woman never nags you. That fantasy woman never smells bad. That fantasy woman is never tired. That fantasy woman wants to have sex with you. That fantasy woman is always wonderful. She'll do anything you want. She's just a fantasy woman with your wife's face. Still a lie, isn't it? The bad part is, then when you go to have sex with your wife, and it's not as good as the fantasy woman with her face, you judge her. Isn't that heavy? That's just intense. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I always get in trouble with this one. Here we go. Autoerotica. <laughs> what is that? That's having sex with yourself. You see, sometimes when we get into this, having women in our minds isn't what it's about. It's about feeling the, the feeling of sex. So we actually have sex with ourselves in masturbation. We have sex with ourselves. It's called autoerotica. It does happen. What am I exposing it for? Because you're still using Jesus' body to do it. <laughs> Can't get away from that, can we? What are you doing? You're having sex with you. Now, if you want to really know, are you a man? Yeah. I, I, do I have to prompt you on this one? <laughs> are you a man? Yeah. Oh, good, right? People came to a men's conference. <laughs> That's all good. Yeah, you're a man, huh? And you're having sex with yourself. You're having sex with a man. What, what does that make that? Yeah, I just thought I'd kill that one right off the bat. <laughs> this is my story. I was studying the scripture about circumcision, right? I had studied about circumcision, I guess, and that it's the marking of the covenant. When God did that for Abraham, he says, now you are marked in covenant with me. And they always knew who would be in covenant with God because all they do is a little physical examination. Look at they're in covenant with God. The circumcision is a mark of covenant. I kind of missed that. And I was starting to understand that. And one day I was masturbating and I realized I had the mark of God's covenant in my hand. It scared me. I mean, it really scared me. I'm using God's covenant for my use. And it just, uh, I never finished that one. That was the last time I masturbated. I had God's covenant. Oh, man, it freaked me out. That, I just thought I'd let you know about that. I can't apply that in any other way. You're just going to have to deal with that as you go. Okay, that was my story. Here's a good one. Wet dreams. What in the world is a wet dream? Well... Probably a lot of you have had them before where you woke up and realized that you'd kind of gone off in the night, okay? <laughs> All I can say is that's what you get for not putting the safety on before you go to bed. <laughs> it just, I, that's so shameless of me in that bed. <laughs> I'm sorry. That just tickles me. I just have to. Anyway, no, what is a wet dream? A wet dream is you've had a dream, and it's a sexual dream, and you actually have sex and get you all excited, and you shoot. Okay, very cool. Okay? That's, yeah. <laughs> what do you do with it? Well, it's really rather simple. Really rather simple. Bring it to Jesus. Lord, I had this dream, and it was a totally sexual dream, and it affected me. What do you want to do? You bring it to Jesus. Lord, would you forgive me? Would you help me? I need to get my dreams taken care of. The Bible says he talks to your soul in the night seasons. So you start listening to him, and that stuff will all change. You get rid of the imagery, and you get rid of the stuff that's happening in your soul, and you'll quit having wet dreams. It's just that simple, okay? But I still think the line about putting on the safety before you go to bed is a good line. It's all good, okay? <laughs> I just let it ride. Let's talk about soul ties. Now, this is fascinating. Soul ties are made anytime 
where there's a strong emotion between people. However, what is really cool is God made them on purpose to work between a husband and a wife. Sex is designed to create a soul tie. People think soul ties are all negative. No, 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 they're, they're very wonderful. What's the issue? Is one flesh. I'm supposed to be having sex with, sex with my wife. I'm supposed to be building a one flesh relationship with her to where our souls become one. Our spirits are already one because we both have the Holy Spirit within us. So that's easy. But our souls are becoming one. We're starting to think the same, feel the same, want the same. We're, we're both growing in, in the Lord, so our souls are becoming one. But to come together physically and become one of body, that's easy to understand. This goes in there and this does, you know, this, this, but that's it. Okay? But we're supposed to be making a soul tie. And every time a man ejaculates, he makes a soul tie. That's what God made it for. That's pretty intense. Now, it also gives life. It brings you into her and her life and that kind of thing. And it makes a new person. That's cool. That doesn't happen every time you have sex. Praise God. Well, some of you, every time you had sex, produce one. You've had sex twice in your marriage. Okay. <laughs> Let that ride. Okay. But every time you ejaculate, you have a soul tie. Meaning what? If you're masturbating over a sexual image over an, a woman, who image of a woman, what happens? You end up having a soul tie with that image. If you've ever had sex with another woman, you have a soul tie with her. Now, you say, well, if it's ejaculation, every time a man ejaculates, it makes a soul tie. What happens whenever a woman? When does she make the soul tie? Boy, it's quiet in here. See, you're really listening, see? <laughs> When does a woman, as soon as she opens her legs to somebody, it's called submission. She submits to what's going on, and she submits her soul when she submits her body. See, we're not going to hear any of this discussion during service on Sunday morning, are we? We're not going to have, you're not going to repeat any of this? <laughs> not this week. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's Palm Sunday tomorrow. What is it? Okay. <laughs> Don't shake your head, no, at me. <laughs> you know how hard it's continue right now? Oh, we just go on. Just go on with it, Lee. Just go on. Okay. When you have a, have a soul tie with somebody, they end up owning a part of you. That's the idea. It makes me in one with my wife, and we are becoming one flesh together, more and more one. That's awesome. They own a part of you. Each soul tie that you have had must be broken individually. Now, just think about this. <laughs> 20 years, <laughs> 20 years on my part of masturbating, how many soul ties do you think I had? In 20 years. Oh my word. <laughs> just the idea. It just staggers the imagination. So. What did I have to do? I had to break them. Individually. I had to break them individually. I'll show you how this works. Okay. Here we go. Now you're going to like this. Here we go. There's a husband. And there's his wife. They have a covenant together. It's really cool. Because a part of his soul and a part of her soul is interchanged. And he gives her of himself, and she gives him of herself. And they, be, and they are making themselves closer and closer, which is, <coughs> which is the one flesh. Isn't that cool? They're giving of itself. They're becoming the same one. They're becoming one flesh. And this is all just like the covenant we have with Jesus. We're giving to him and taking from him. And we are becoming one with him. That's the idea. That's what the husband and wife and Jesus and the church, this what this whole picture is about. But what happens if a guy takes a part of his soul and gives it to somebody else through fornication or even through judgments? You can give a soul tie. And you give of yourself to somebody else. What do you take in return? Hollowness. Emptiness. Pretty sad. Remember that guy that said he had to have sex with somebody every day? 
What did he tell me? He said, I'm hollow. He had given so much of his soul away that he was just a, a shell. By the way, just to let you know, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ and that was all changed and his addiction was broken. And he came back that next morning and it was almost impossible to keep him sitting still. He was just freaking out. So what do you do with this soul tie? Well, repentance, renouncing, retrieval, and forgiveness. You repent it. You renounce this soul tie. You retrieve the part that you gave and give back what you had taken. And you ask the Lord to forgive you for making this soul tie. And what happens? You can actually get that part back. Here's a guy. He's done that. He's got part of his soul out. What happens if he does it again? What happens if he does it again? What happens if he does it again? See, this is what we've been doing. And then we wonder how come we're not a whole man to be the man of God that we've been called to be. We've given of ourselves, given it away. Never taken it back. You listening? Does this make sense? <laughs> you say, what do I do about it? Okay. Well, you have the Lord bring one to mind, and we're going to do this in just a second. Confess it and receive forgiveness. Renounce the misuse of your body. Doesn't it sound familiar? Love her through the eyes of the Lord. Then we got to break the soul tie and take possession of it. You die to that old covenant, the flesh. Stand up. You're going to like this. I'm going to teach you how to do this because you're going to have to do this a lot. Because you're going to have to ask the Lord how many soul ties you have. <laughs> I'm, I can't tell you the answer. <laughs> but it's going to take you a while. Lord, would you come to each man? Would you bring to mind a time of sexual use? A time of lust and work of sexual, sexuality? Lord, bring it to mind. Yeah, you got one right there. So let's confess it and receive forgiveness. Say, Lord, I did do this. And it was wrong. It caused damage. Lord, would you please forgive me? And what's he say? Never walk away until you hear the answer. Say, I renounce the misuse of my body in this. I renounce the misuse of my body in this. I bring it back into the hands of Jesus. Lord, would you show me how you see her, please? Lord, would you show me how you see her, please? How does he see her? We're breaking the power of lust. It's starting to love. I want you to say, Lord, I, I made a soul tie with this woman. It was wrong. I now renounce this soul tie. I give back what I have taken. I take back what I have given. I break this soul tie and its effect. And I bring it back into myself. Thank you, Lord, for breaking this. Wasn't hard, was it? But you can feel it happen, can't you? It seems sneaky, isn't that sneaky? It's workable. And you're sitting there going, oh, but it's just flooding in my head and how many of these I've made. <laughs> and you better get to work, huh? Have a chair. I taught a man one day, we taught him how to do these. And he determined, he says, you know how many that is? That doesn't rank in the hundreds. That ranks in the thousands. I says, it's not up to me. It's up to between you and the Lord. So he determined that every night he would spend an hour breaking soul ties. Because see, it's all up to the Lord. It's not up to you to try to find them. So he just say, Lord, would you bring one to mind, please? Just like we did. And someone come to mind, he goes, oh. 
Lord, I did do that. Would you please forgive me? I renounce my body, my misuse of my body. Lord, show me how this woman looks in your eyes. And it got quicker. He got to the point where he was almost not even having to ask. As soon as the image was coming up, he was starting to love. He was breaking them that fast. And he broke that soul tie. I give back. I retrieve back. This soul tie is now broken. In Jesus' name, it's done. Lord, would you send me another picture, please? He just started doing that. It took him just a couple minutes with each one. And he was doing it for an hour a night. So I talked to him about two weeks after I'd first initially talked talk to him. I said, so how's it going with the breaking the soul ties? I'm working on it. Leave me alone. Cool. Fine. So I'm about a month after that. How's it going? I am. I'm working on it. Cool. Just checking. It's all good. Another month or so. I am. I'm still working on it. All of a sudden, one day, he came into my office, and he almost hit his head on the top of the door frame because he was not on the ground anymore. Just, he was bouncing. He was thrilled. And, I, and he, was just, he came and says, guess what? He says, uh, won the lottery? I'm going to regret being a smart aleck one of these days. And he says, no, guess, come on. He says, you got the last soul tie, didn't you? Yes, I did. I said, tell me about it. He says, I was saying, Lord, bring me another one. And he did. So I did. Broke the soul tie. That's broken. That's all good. Thank you, Lord. I see her. It's all good. Whew. Lord, show me another one. Desert wind. Nothing. He actually thought he put the Lord to sleep. Thought he had finally bored him. Okay. No, Lord doesn't do that. It's all good. And he went, Lord, come on, bring me another one. Lord. Little light came on. Boom. Lord, was that the last one? Lord says, yes, you're free. Can you imagine the worship service that happened right there? The freedom that he had, he was all over himself. Just, this is so cool. The freedom. He knew that his soul was finally free between him and the Lord, and he could give his soul to the Lord without any reservation. How cool, huh? So I look at him and says, hey, I've confiscated some porn. You want to look at it? He say, did you really do that? Yeah. I wanted to see his reaction. And he went, no! I've just been all this time breaking soul ties. You think I want to make another one? Are you out of your mind? And he's just like, just, just, just living. I said, I, I didn't confiscate any. I don't have any here. I'm just testing to see how things work. He says, you're not a nice man. <laughs> yes, I am. Just have a little ornery streak about well, it's in there somewhere. I wanted to test the waters. How'd you do? He said, man, I'm so free. I don't want it. I don't want it. It's not like saying, oh, I have to struggle. I don't want to lust. I don't want to do any good stuff. I want to be free. I want to be righteous. I want to be holy. I like this. Amen. I like it too. Died of that old covenant, the flesh. Okay. Accountability. You say, I thought you said you didn't use accountability. I said, we did use accountability. We just do a whole bunch of other stuff. But I do use accountability, some. So I have the right, because you came here, from now on for the rest of your life, if I ever see you anywhere, I can walk up to you at any given time and ask, hi, how's your purity? You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know, most of the time, you don't even have to answer. Depends on, yeah, your reaction. Oh, God, you know. Ah, well, okay. Now that did, I walked up to a guy one day and he was part of our stuff. He was doing, you know, we were learning all this together. He's part of the church in Greeley. And I walked up to him and I said, hi. He said, hi, how's it going? Hi. How's your purity? And he stopped dead into the eyes. And he started to cry. 
His tears started pouring down his face, and he's looking at me, and I'm going, oh, buddy, what did you do? My God. I just look at him like this, and he's crying. He can't breathe. And finally he goes, I am absolutely pure. <laughs> Don't do that. Nobody asked him. And he suddenly went, I am pure. And it hit him so hard in his soul that he could tell somebody, I've been pure. I'm good. It's good to go. And he just stood there and started crying. <laughs> that drove me crazy. Okay. I deserved that, by the way. <laughs> Who said true? Okay, that's okay. okay. <laughs> if a brother falls, what do you do? Well, you help him with dealing with self-condemnation because as soon as a guy falls, what's he do? He beats himself up because he shouldn't have done this. No, just help him deal with it. Accountability. We're in this together. Well, let's just take it to Jesus, okay? Lord, I did fall. Would you please forgive me? Now, why do I always ask, and what did he say? Because the majority of the times we ask the Lord for forgiveness and we don't stop and listen to the answer. Well, that's rude. That's just rude to ask somebody a question and then walk away without hearing the answer. That's just rude. So I tell people, stop. What did you say? What do you mean what did you say? You asked him a question. What's the answer? Uh, don't assume the answer. Get an answer. Do you forgive me? So I have him ask him again. Lord, do you forgive me? And they stand there and look at him. Well... The Lord answers. That's when you know you're forgiven. You can walk away clean when you hear it from him. You're forgiven. It's cool. How fun. So how's his identity? Did he pick up fornication again? What's on him? You might have to walk him right through it, okay? There's a reason he fell. There's a reason he fell. Ask the Lord, why'd you do it? What's going on in your life? What was it? Just tired? Stress? Find out. Find out. Okay? It, it sounds like a condemnation question. Why did you do that? No, it doesn't come with that kind of tone behind it. Why did you do it? Why did you fall? What is there that caused it? Oh, I just got tired. Lack of discipline. Okay, cool. Let's go on. <laughs> Pray with him. Pray with him. How's accountability work? praise. It's not because you're calling, <laughs> excuse me, you're calling me so that I become the one to hold you accountable so you don't have to have discipline. That's not what this is about. Because you're standing before God. But it is cool for a band of brothers to walk up and say, how's your purity going? And checking on each other. That's good. That's a good thing. We can do that together. Okay. <clears throat> Confession to your wife. Confession to your wife. This is why we said don't do it last night because we're going to do it right here and show you how, okay? People say, should I? <laughs> Absolutely mandatory. Why? <laughs> because you're going to be standing there one day and some guy's going to be talking to you about it and you're going to say, oh yeah. He says, well, I know. I was in porn just like you are. And your wife's going to say, you were? You are in more trouble than you can swim. When you're willing to tell somebody else and not willing to tell her, oh, that's not good. That will come back and bite you, okay? Because what is sad is you're free from the defilement, but she isn't. Until you minister to her about what's been going on in your life and helping her deal with the junk that you brought to the marriage, how in the world is she going to get free? I saw this happen right on my wife. I saw it happen. The... I finally confessed it, and it was gone off of me. I was no longer living in the closet. Man, it was so cool. And I could just see all this weight just fall off of me and right on her. Boy, that was tough. But it must be true repentance. When you confess to your wife, I mean, there must be true repentance. I knew a guy that said, oh, by the way, honey, I've been in porn for the last four or five years, but I'm out of it now. It's all good, and walked away. It's all good? No, it's not all good. He found himself sleeping at his friend's house that night. There was major damage that was done. He was flippant. No, this is serious. Confess it seriously. 
There must be true repentance in your eyes and in your voice, and she must see the humility of what's going on with it. You've got to take all the responsibility. One guy told his wife, yeah, I've been doing the porn, but if you'd put out more often, I wouldn't have to. Yeah, well, there was a divorce coming on that one. Take all the responsibility. By the way, that, that size matters things. I had a guy come up to me once in England. <laughs> and he says, uh, I, was, I was engaged to be married, but I broke it off. I says, oh, really? Why? He says, her boobs aren't big enough. <laughs> really? Well, I'm glad you broke it off. He says, you are? Really? Oh, yeah, because she deserves much better than you. Just thought I'd let you know. Yeah. We do this. Take all the responsibility. Okay? Pray about a time and a place. Make sure that it's not just on the cuff. Think about this thing. Get rid of all kids, dogs, cats, phones, you name it. Nothing. Get her out somewhere where it's private and there will be no interruptions. Pray about a time and a place. Be totally humble, totally humble. This is a serious, serious deal because it will take time for her to trust you. All of a sudden, you told her how untrustworthy you are and you think she's going to trust you for a while? She's going to have to see you live in that purity for a period before she trusts you again. It's going to take some time. Let it. It's okay. You say, well, but she's not going to have sex with me for a while. Dang straight. I wouldn't either. Well, I'm not going to have sex with you anyway. But thank God. Hey, praise God. I would agree with her, in other words. That just turned out wrong, didn't it? I hate it when that happens. <laughs> but I would agree with her. I would say that she shouldn't have sex with you for a while. Why? Because it's been defiling. Until she proves that it's not defiling, she doesn't want it anymore. Remember the security and safety issue? All of a sudden, you're going to fill her with more defilement? I don't think so. It's pretty heavy. It'll take time for her to trust you. So you stay humble and pray for her. Stay humble and pray for her. Too cool. Expect to be tested and watched very closely. <laughs> I mean, expect it. She will watch your every move for a while. I like this one, too. She's your main helper in all of this. <laughs> and this is my story. This is, this is so true. I had nobody to help me walk through this. Nobody taught me how. I've been set free, and I told you it took me four years to learn how to stay free. Been set free in a minute. Four years it took me to figure out how to stay free. This was exponential learning curve. <laughs> okay. I told my wife, I, <laughs> I looked at her and said, honey, I'm now o open. I've given you all, everything. You now know it all. I need your help to learn how to stay free in this. I need your help in this. Now, in my mind's eye, I swear, her hair went limp. Her ears went back. Fangs grew out. She got this look in her eye. And she said to me these exact words. I will help you. <laughs> Can I take that back? <laughs> no. I will help you. <laughs> I don't want My life just left. I died that moment. So we'd be walking in the mall and she would say, don't look right. Now, what? Slap me on the arm. When I tell you don't look right, it doesn't mean look right to see what I told you not to look right to see. Don't look right when I tell you don't look right. You got that? Okay, I got it. 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 Don't look left. What? I tell you don't look left. What I mean is you don't look left to see what's over there, okay? And it's just like, I got it. So it got really touchy because sometimes she'd say, don't look right. And I'd look over there. She didn't see that one. Oh, God. Okay, it was, it was tough. It finally got to the point 
Where if she said don't, if she started the sentence with don't, I just closed my eyes and stopped because I didn't know how to do this love her stuff yet, okay? I ran into more things. Don't, what? <laughs> and then she said, don't forget we need to go to the post office on the way home. I don't start sentences with don't. Unless you... <laughs> it was miserable for a while. It was tough. One day, though, I was we were down at one of the malls, and this gal came out of a, of a shop, and I, I tell you, she had to have a 60-inch bust, and she wasn't fat. She massive, massive, massive breasts. And I saw her, and my wife saw her at the same time. And she looked over at me, and tears started pouring out of my eyes. I sat down on a fountain right there and just, just, and she says, why did that make you cry? She had huge boobs. And that's why. Do you know that nobody will be able to talk to her without noticing her breasts? She's a pair of walking boobs to everybody, men and women. She can never have an identity other than she's the big boob gal. And it broke my heart. And that was the first day that my wife said, you know, I think I can trust you. When she is convinced you are trustworthy, well, your intimacy will show it. What are you doing? You're starting for the ice cream. When she can trust you, you're heading towards ice cream, buddy. When there's no more motor oil, you're no more providing any motor oil, what are you doing? You're getting to the point where there's ice cream. And that you cannot, you cannot do anything worse. That is amazing. It's awesome. Homework. Let me show you your homework. You got homework. You do? <laughs> Yeah, first thing is let the Lord show you what needs to go on and work with him. It's right there in your manual. Your homeworks are right there. You got to start with what the Lord wants you to do. It's you between you and him. It's not between you and me. See, when I say the last amen this, this afternoon, I'm done with you except for some accountability if I see you somewhere. Okay? It's not up to me to make you live it. But it's between you and Jesus, and it is up to me to remind you that Jesus is walking out with you, and you are not alone. You have been bought with a price, and you are right there with him, and you're going to have to walk it out with him. Let the Lord show you and work with you on that. You aren't finished with soul ties until they're gone. When Jesus says they're gone, they're gone. Don't give me any of the other lip. That's all there is to it. If he says they're gone, they're gone. If he doesn't, you're, they're not. When you are free, you will know it. Now, talk to the shirts. They'll tell you there was a time when they knew they were free. Greg, right? Jared? Nathaniel? Rick? They knew it. They knew it. Did it take some time? Was there work involved? <laughs> was it worth it? Okay, guys... So here's the big one. Your big homework is never stop using your weapons. Never stop. You got to find your first bullet, second bullet, third bullet, fourth bullet. You got to find and load your gun. And you'd be ready to start because when you get out there today, today, as you walk out the door, you are walking into a battlefield. And you are going to get shot at. And you better start loading your gun now. You got to see who you are in your purity who are you? Remember that outfit you put on? That's who you are. See it. Understand it. Which is, I think is kind of fascinating because I got armor. I got all sorts of weird stuff. So I think you knew that. So when I started talking about bullets and stuff, I see this knight in this awesome armor and he's got a six gun. That's weird. A western knight. Okay. I also have a sword, and I use that sword rather often. It's pretty cool, but I do, I do carry my gun. I want to do quick draw every time I'm around. Boom. I know that woman is not going to make me lust. Okay. Just recently, I was standing talking, and this really fine-looking lady walked up to me, and she was talking, and she she turned around, and I had my arms folded like this, and I had my hand like this, 
and she put her breast right into my hand and kept it. She was keeping it there. And I, I just, no, I don't want to touch that. It's not mine. I don't want it. But it just instantly made me think sexually of her. Boom, I had to, in a conversation with her, boom, point blank range. I had to think, no, wife right here. Bubble. <laughs> you got to see who you are in your purity. Who are you? It's, it's a warfare. That's the priest that God has called you to be. Amen? So you need to put off the old, put on the new, step into Christ, make no provision to go back to the old. Because this is kind of our whole thing. Romans, that Romans 13 passage, the night is far gone, the day is drawn near. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the weapons of light. Let us walk becomingly as in the day, not in carousings and drunkennesses, not in cohabitation, lustful acts, not in fighting and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not make forethought for the flesh for its lust. That's the whole conference in a nutshell. That's everything right there. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk it out. It's an event that leads to a process this is who you really, really are. Because the real you is free. Right? For those of you who really need to know how I see myself, I am Zorro. You can just deal with it. You want to bet? <laughs> I got the swords to prove it. <laughs> no, I, I see myself as the one who has... Not out there with an identity, whatever it has, but I'm in there, in the trenches, where everything else is, and I'm going out there being the one fighting for those who need to be fought for. It's the way it is. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of all you've done for us. Lord, as we get rid of the lies, as we get rid of these things in our lives, Lord, may we walk in purity like never before. And Lord, all we've been given is the tools. Now we have to walk it out. Lord, we have so much to do. We give you praise for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Give yourself a little break. It's 122. Uh, let's go to 135. Come back on in when you get a chance, about 135, and we'll start up again. We have one short session after this, but it's probably the most important one. So hang in there. You're doing great. Go with God.